Now it's my, my great pleasure to welcome Sir Mark Walport to give the opening keynote. Sir Mark uh, is the Chief Scientific Advisor to Her Majesty's Government and Head of Government Office for Science in, in the UK. The, the theme and the topic of Sir Mark's presentation is science and the library in the 21st century. So for us, for this audience, as, as we are all librarians or working at libraries, uh, this, this talk will be of utmost importance. So welcome, Sir Mark. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And it's a great pleasure and honor to be giving this address. In fact, it's the second time that I've addressed the LIBA conference. The last time was about 10 years ago um, in the National Library of Russia at St. Petersburg. Um, and there's been an extraordinary progress in open science in the last 10 years. Um, and if there's a theme to my talk, the theme is of the librarian as a visionary, because there's no doubt that you have a visionary importance in the communication of knowledge. Um, and I will start and I will end with the Library of Alexandria, because there's no doubt there that the librarians had vision. Um, so much of it is based on true history and how much on mythology at this distance is difficult to know. Um, but the concept of collecting the world's knowledge into a library, in this case a physical space, but now a virtual space, um, is one that is a very ancient one. And I think that we know something of the Library of Alexandria via Galen. Um, it was a sort of copyright library to dream of, in a way, in that anyone who turned up with a book or a scroll found that it was confiscated. Um, and um, owners apparently received a copy back with the originals kept for the collection. Um, how long it took to get your copy back, I'm not sure history relates, um, but there were no uh, photocopying or PDF files in those days. Um, but the concept, I think, was a very important one. Um, and um, moving onwards, of course, uh, the library has not always been simply a repository of open knowledge. So libraries have been collections, but actually some libraries have been closed libraries. Um, for political reasons, uh, because the material they held was thought to be uh, seditious in some way, because it was pornographic or otherwise um, might uh, cause moral issues in the population. Um, and access under some circumstances was only granted under special circumstances. Um, so the library has an important history, and I think that this slide reminds us of a very important theme, which is that knowledge is power. Um, and that's why the work librarians do is so important. Um, and of course, one of the first things that happens when repressive regimes take over is that they go for universities and they go for libraries. And so this is actually a serious topic as well as an important topic. Um, the other theme is that, of course, we're going through the most extraordinary revolution in the way that uh, knowledge is uh, generated and can be communicated. And I think it's not an exaggeration to say that uh, electronic publication is a second uh, Gutenberg moment. Uh, so we went through the world of the manuscript science. Um, it was the Royal Society 350 years ago that founded the subscription journal um, the subscription as a way of distributing uh, scientific papers through the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. Um, and now we're in a third revolution where that information can be made available in principle to everyone who has got online access through the modern of, model of open access and the ability to communicate the scientific paper in ways that was never possible before. And I think that we're only at the start of this latest revolution, uh, because it's a revolution not only of the distribution of text and numbers and images, uh, but we're moving to a world of the Internet of Things, and I can see various bits of the Internet of Things being held up in the audience, of devices, the things that we manufacture, each of which will contain a chip, and that chip will be able to communicate wirelessly with other objects, um, uh, with the internet, 
Um, and we're moving into an extraordinary, ubiquitously sensed world, uh, which will enable many services. It will bring huge new challenges in terms of privacy, autonomy, security. Uh, but we're only at the start of the revolution. And of course, those bits of silicon that are being waved around the room at the moment are meaning that this lecture is being communicated almost instantly around the world, uh, though mainly, I think, in uh, Twitter size um, uh, packages. <laughs> Um, and, of course, the point about information and knowledge is not only the fact that it's available, but, of course, the challenge of how you find it. Um, my background is a medical background, and I remember that as a young doctor at the Royal Postgraduate Medical School, when you wanted to find the past literature, uh, you went down to the basement where there was the Surgeon General's Index Medicus, and you would go through it year by year, searching manually through these classical indices. Um, and it was a remarkable, it was, a, it was the best that could be done, but if you think what can be done now at the press of a few keys, then it is actually the power of indexing that's almost as big a revolution as the power actually of having the words, the images themselves online. Um, and of course, no one I think could have anticipated the full consequences of the information revolution when it started. Um, and there are therefore new policy questions that have arisen as a result of it. And of course, we've moved from a world where the distribution of the world's knowledge, the subscription journal, the payment model then was that the communication was read at the Royal Society or in another national academy somewhere around the world. It was uh, basically a laboriously typeset. And then the means of distribution is that people would pay for a subscription. Um, but we're now in a world where I think that the publication of the research is an, an intrinsic cost of that research. And so the funders of research fund the costs. And when I was at the Wellcome Trust, um, we reckoned that it was about 1% of the costs of the biomedical research that we were funding at the Wellcome Trust. That's a cost of research. It's a cost of research like paying for the salary of the researcher uh, in the case of laboratory science, we're paying for the centrifuge for the reagents. And in fact, the utility of the research was maximized by the maximization of its distribution. And the role of the publisher is to provide a service in so doing and to be paid by the, re the, the research funder in order to do that. Um, but of course, our old copyright laws now require looking at again. And in the UK, the copyright law has now been amended to permit text and data mining. In other words, that depth of indexing uh, that goes far beyond anything that the individuals who created the Surgeon General's Index Medicus would have been capable of doing. So we now have the most extraordinary power of indexing, and we have to find ways to apply that to make sure that the world has access to knowledge as fast as possible. Now, I think that the other very big change, and this is the revolutionary bit, is that all stages of research may now be made accessible. And so open science refers to much more than open access. So open access is about making, if you like, the final product of the research, the research paper, the research monograph, available. But of course, potentially now, we can make the whole process of science from the collecting of the data in some circumstances, all the way through to different sorts of data, all the way through to the final result, we can make all of that open and accessible. And the challenge is not just of openness, but it is actually accessibility. We have to provide the metadata to make data useful. So data without metadata is not particularly useful. It's about intelligent accessibility. And there are now increasingly examples of citizen science, uh, big projects like Galaxy Zoo, where anyone can classify the shape of galaxies to help us understand more about the astronomical universe in which we live, um, through to ecological databases, publicly collected information about the spread of diseases such as ash dieback, which is affecting ash trees in Europe and other parts of the world. Um, there's then all of the data generated by different sources, uh, some of it government data, administrative data sets, 
uh, data from organizations such as Meteorological Office in the UK, Met offices around the world, mapping information uh, through to research data, um, much of which is generated in research institutes and universities around the world. Um, and then, finally, the, the product itself. And I think when we're talking about open science, we have to think about each of these different elements and also work out how we can do this, because, of course, the quantity of data here is absolutely gigantic. And what we have to do is make it not only accessible, but make it useful. Um, and essentially, the more people can see the research, the more impact it will have. Um, it doesn't take away the fact that there are costs of publication, um, but the publication costs move upstream to the organizations that are funding the research. Um, and with the efficiency of open access publishing, I think we will move to a world where the costs of publication are reduced. Um, it would be nice to be able to say that the quantity of trees being felled is being uh, reduced by open access publishing, but I think we still live in a world where many people uh, still print out, um, and so I think that there's still something to be achieved on that front. Um, and, of course, the thing about electronic publication is that it allows um, the inclusion of the data, the metadata, community annotation and feedback. There is all the backstory of a publication that can be included in it um, at the same time and indeed subsequently, and that's something that I'll come on to in a moment or two. Um, and we now have uh, an increasing and fascinating marketplace of startups and established companies who are working out how to deliver services um, in order to improve uh, the access, the utility of all of the knowledge that's out there. And so people talk about science at 2.0, um, and no doubt in time they'll talk about science 3.0, etc., etc. Um, but this is an extraordinarily dynamic area uh, where, again, uh, startup companies, visionaries of different sorts, are having an extraordinary amount of information to play with uh, to all of our benefit. So, of course, it would be wrong to say that there weren't challenges as well. Um, and I think one of the issues, um, and there's been a great deal of focus on fraud in science, um, but I think that that is only, in fact, probably a small part of the story. The bigger part of the story is, if you like, increasing the trustworthiness of the science enterprise. So it's the way the scientific endeavor is conducted. Um, and, of course, one of the greatest defenses against fraud is the skepticism of the scientific community. So one of the values of scientists is skepticism, it's rigor, it's reproducibility. And what's very important is that actually it's rooted out at its cause, and that is most likely to be in the laboratories where uh, malpractice happens. Um, but for every example of fraud, there are probably many examples of incompetence. And someone has already worked out the, uh, that correlation and causation are not the same thing. Um, so I don't think anyone would think that the um, change in the Internet Explorer share of the market uh, would be in some way causally linked to the fall in the murder rate. Um, but it makes the point that there is always a danger in very large data sets. And I think that's one of the new challenges of science that, in fact, we can generate quantities of data that are almost unimaginable. Uh, so when I started doing research and was interested in uh, genetic associations with disease, you got quite excited if you could find a couple of hundred uh, patients with a particular condition and a similar number of controls and maybe look at genetic variation in one or two genes. Um, in the UK, we're now doing the full genome sequencing of 100,000 people uh, in the National Health Service with various conditions. Um, and just the scale of the data that's generated means that actually finding the needle in the haystack, finding the signal amidst the noise, is technically an extremely difficult thing to do. And so one of the challenges of large data sets is making sure um, that one's not confusing causation with correlation. Um, so science is hard. There are honest mistakes. There's sloppiness in conducting underpowered studies, for example. Um, 
And there are, of course, the biases of publication, which it's still the case that it's easier to publish a paper that has positive findings rather than negative findings. It's still the case that it's harder to publish a, either a confirmation of a piece of research or indeed a refutation of a piece of research. And so I think that everyone in the science enterprise needs to think about how we can each contribute to increasing the trustworthiness of science. And I, I should emphasize that actually science is, if you ask the generic question, very well trusted. Um, but it doesn't alter the fact that I think as part of the skepticism, as part of the value system of science, it's incumbent on all of us to work all the time to increase um, uh, the reliability of the exercise. And that brings me on to a second area of a different sort of incompetence, where the pressure to report the results of a single paper um, can add distortion. And so I'll give you an illustration of that in just a moment. And we need to work out how we can incentivize quality, rigor, and repeatability as much as the volume and, uh, of new research, as it were. We need to get that balance right. Um, and on that point, it's really possible to find um, uh, articles claiming that almost any food either cures all cancers or cures all cancers. Um, and these are just examples of um, different uh, articles that have come out in papers uh, over the last few years. And the point here is that I think that um, we just have to be very careful about overhyping the results of any single study because it's rarely possible to draw robust conclusions from single studies. And I would comment in parenthesis that really one of the challenges of being the chief scientific advisor to the government is that I have to communicate, and my job is to advise, it's not to make the policy. The people that make policy are the policy makers, <coughs> the politicians that we elect. But what I need is not the single paper. What I need is the very careful meta-analysis. And again, in some senses, that's part of the world of curation of knowledge. And of course, that's what librarians are all about. It's about curating our knowledge. Uh, but it's also part of the scientific communities job as well, which is actually not only to do the initial analysis, but to do the meta-analysis, to bring together the knowledge, put it together, recognizing that it's contingent, that there will be uncertainties. And unfortunately, once a meta-analysis is done once, it needs to be done again as new information arises. And again, we need to think about how we accumulate and aggregate knowledge in the virtual libraries of the present and the future to enable that meta-analysis to happen most effectively. Um, and I think there is an interesting question, and this is more speculation than, um, a, a, as it were, setting a direction. Um, but the concept the, uh, uh, of the way science was done, which is that every piece of work you write as a distinct paper, uh, you write a slightly updated introduction because it's based on what's happened since the last paper, you do the materials and methods, the results, the discussion, and then you start again. Does that entirely make sense? I mean, can we now think about how you could actually accumulate and aggregate things onto papers? Uh, whether the original paper isn't the place that someone should publish either the confirmation or indeed the refutation. It's the idea as the paper as almost the source of online debate and addition. And so I think with imagination, it seems to me that actually the concept of what is a scientific paper is something that will evolve over the next few years. Um, and how can we persuade um, scientists to comment? Because it's quite interesting. A number of the online journals now have places where scientists can comment on each other's work. And as yet, they are not really doing it. It's, a rather, it's rather different from the humanities. Uh, the humanities gets a lot of refereeing after the event in the form of uh, criticisms. Um, in science, it's a bit slower to happen. So there are some interesting cultural issues, I think. Um, now, in the next stage of my remarks, I, I just want to say something about knowledge transmission because that's absolutely critical. Um, and science isn't finished until it's communicated. And I think that we need to pay much more attention on how that communication happens. Um, and I always say when I'm giving career-type talks to scientists that actually if you take the skills of a scientist, which are... Uh, to be able to inquire into nature, to understand uncertainty, to be able to set up and test hypotheses, to know about statistics. 
Um, and then also to be able to communicate the research in writing, visually, verbally. That's an extraordinary set of skills for individuals to have, and the world should be the scientist's oyster. Um, and I'm just reminded, and this was some work that when we were reviewing um, STEM education in the UK some years ago, um, there was a report by J.J. Uh, Thompson, who was the president of the Royal Society during the First World War, um, and he chaired a committee to inquire into the position of natural science in the educational system of Great Britain. And I really like this quote. All through the science course, the greatest care should be taken to insist on the accurate use of the English language. Um, and I think that remains as true now as it was then. Um, but increasingly, the challenge, of course, is how we communicate three-dimensional data sets with sometimes billions of points in them. Um, and so we also need the skills of graphic design. Um, uh, on the right, you see how um, uh, genomic information can be communicated. So uh, cancer genomic information, for example, where you've got essentially you're comparing 3.2 billion base pairs between one individual and another, or between a, a cancer genome and the germline genome of the person that has the cancer. Um, on the left um, is, is the image of um, how one might visualize a metric ton of carbon. Uh, because if you're talking about um, climate change, then the challenge is one of both small numbers and large numbers. How do you convey the idea that actually a 0.9 degree centigrade change in the atmospheric temperature over the last century is a very important difference? And equally, how can you convey what more than 10 gigatons of carbon emissions into the atmosphere looks like? What's 10 gigatons? Uh, 10 billion tons, 10,000 million tons, very difficult to convey. Um, but this is what a metric ton of uh, carbon dioxide looks like, um, I think, in a New York street, judging by the cars. Uh, but it would look the same in any other street. Um, and I think that we also have to recognize, and I think this is something to, that is very apposite to the job of a scientific advisor, that we're also communicating to multiple audiences. And here again, I think that this is a fantastic opportunity for open science, because if you like, the original scientific paper speaks in one way. It basically is presented to a particular audience, and actually, as it has become more and more compressed and codified, those very short reports in some of the journals that are, um, have very strong brands indeed um, have become so uh, laden with code that they require, in fact, um, uh, news articles to explain what's in them. Um, and I think the challenge and the opportunity for the scientific enterprise is how can the libraries of the present and the future communicate the same basic data to utterly different audiences? And so when we talk about public engagement, there are, of course, multiple publics. So my job is mainly to communicate science to the people that live in Downing Street and in the corridors of Whitehall. Um, there is the general public, there's communication to scientists, and I think scientists quite often forget that actually, if you have the whole range of scientists in this room, um, then probably the area of science that any individual scientist will be communicating to will be sort of half of one of the rows. And so scientific audiences are often largely lay audiences as well. Um, and then there's how do we communicate uh, in schools, in universities, throughout education. So again, these are all opportunities. I just want to make a specific point on the aspect of providing science advice to policymakers, because uh, of course the library, again, has an important role in this. And I think that what we need to recognize is that policymakers themselves look at issues through multiple lenses. So they look at issues typically through, if there is science, through a scientific lens, but they also look if there's a policy delivery through the delivery lens, can the policy be delivered? And then if they're political policy makers, they look through political lenses, they look through the lenses of society, of culture, of values. Um, and so the science is part of the story, but it's very rarely the only part of the story. And that's why the job of the scientist is to advise and it's quite important that scientists distinguish between giving advice and an advocacy role. So 
again, I don't think you really need persuading that uh, libraries like this are rather rare things these days, um, although I have to say that I am a bibliophile and there is nothing that quite beats a proper nice old book. Um, but of course, this is what the library looks like now. Uh, many of you are actually holding libraries in your hands. Um, the contents of those, be they tablets or um, the different sorts of um, laptops, are probably, you know, they, if you added together the libraries, that is, the books that are just sitting in this room, the papers, I suspect it would populate a significant fraction of the upper floors of the building that uh, Sir Adrian Smith talked about. Um, and, of course, the public library itself um, is evolving. Um, this was the libraries of my youth. Uh, the illustration on the right is of the new library at Florida Polytechnic University, which has no paper books, apparently. So libraries are going to be very different places. And um, finishing where I started, I think that we are now back and we'll really be able to create the Library of Alexandria in a way that the curators, the librarians of the Library of Alexandria could only have dreamt about. I think the Library of Alexandria is something that we have in our power to create, and the skills of the librarian are going to be completely different skills in the future as well. And so Adrian Smith talked about the Alan Turing Institute, and that's a photograph of Alan Turing. And uh, the Turing Institute is intended to bring together uh, the best computer science in the world with the best mathematics for to develop algorithms and other uh, computer applications for human benefit. And I think that it's absolutely wonderful and fitting that the Alan Turing Institute should be housed inside the British Library. Because the library of the future is a library which is about how information is curated, how it's delivered, and algorithms are going to be an extraordinarily important part of that. So I think, in conclusion, the vision here is that the library will turn absolutely inside out. Um, and I'm not for a second saying that we're going to dispose of all of those wonderful vellum manuscripts, um, of those illuminated manuscripts. But what we are going to do is we're going to be able to disseminate them in ways that were undreamt of. And I think it will also transform the practice of science. Thank you for your attention. Okay, now we have some 15 minutes for questions. Uh, while you are thinking, actually, I, I, I have one. Uh, you, you mentioned um, that here in the UK you have the possibility, legal possibility, to text and data mine. Mm. And uh, in other countries in Europe, we are very hard advocating and, and lobbying for this uh, possibility. Uh, perhaps you are aware of the yes, Hague Declaration, which was quite recently published. Uh, so I'd like you to tell us sort of what is, how you see the importance of this possibility here in the Hague to text and data mine. Can you see already some, some evidence that sort of some, something new has been found throughout text and data mining of big quantities of, of data? Or, what is the importance of this? Oh, I, I, well, I mean, I, I think the, the, the importance is that it comes back to the fact that, as it were, traditional indexing techniques only capture a tiny fraction of uh, what's in uh, paper publications. And so the ability to mine, for example, papers on different sorts of uh, cancer, on different sorts of proteins, has the potential to create linkages that we didn't know about before. So I think it has the potential to generate hypotheses. I think that's the importance of it. Um, and as I say, if we, given that I think everyone here would recognize the power, the, the fact that indexing itself is going from 1.0 to about 10.0, actually. I mean, the capacity to index is just extraordinary. Um, we can only find stuff if we can index it. And of course, it's about bringing together indices of different sorts. It's about aggregating indices of protein databases, of DNA databases, 
Um, I'm not sure one would integrate them with astronomical databases, but at some point, who knows if we're interested in where um, life has come from or something. But um, it, so I think the, the, I think the, the, the importance of this is fairly obvious, um, and I think it's worth saying in the context of the UK that the UK government really recognises the power of. Um, information and has been very committed to making government data sets widely available as well. Um, and, you know, one of the things that you can do whilst you're in London is if you want to get about, you can use an app called City Mapper. Um, and City Mapper depends on the fact that there are APIs for different types of transport which will tell you what bus is going where, they'll tell you where buses are at particular times, where the tubes are, what's running, what isn't. And it, actually, it's about integrating different transport modalities so it will get you to walk catch the bus and the train and the tube and give you and use algorithms to optimize your route that's what indexing is all about actually thank you so here in the front we have one question do we have a mic yes it's coming and and please tell who you are where you come from stephen pinfield from the university of sheffield thank you very much for your presentation. You mentioned about the need to incentivize rigor and quality. Um, how, do, how do you suggest that should be done when the current emphasis is very much on quantity of publications, particularly in particular journals? So how do we incentivize scientists to pursue quality and rigor as well as quantity of output? Well, I, I mean, I'd actually challenge you on the fact that the incentive is for quantity, um, and this is a sort of slightly local discussion in a way, but one of the major impacts of what was the research and ex assessment exercise, now the REF, was to reduce the demands on volume on academics. So when it started, you could submit any number of papers, and indeed there was some implicit, though I think not explicit, pressure to do so. But really rather early in the 1990s, only four papers were allowed per academic. And that actually, uh, over a four or five year period, that's certainly not seeking volume. Um, I think the challenge also is um, at the funding agencies to make sure that when they fund work, it's funded at an adequate power. And again, I think that's for the referee community as much as it is for anyone else, because it's referees that are very important in determining funding decisions. But for example, in the case of animal research, the research councils have made it absolutely clear that they won't fund research that isn't adequately powered. Um, so I think it's about uh, the research enterprise as a whole, and I think it's for all of us. I think it's uh, the individual academic, I think it's for universities, I think it's for funders, uh, to recognize that um, uh, there is always a trade-off between the number of studies funded and making sure that those studies that are funded are of a size and quality that enables the work to be done rigorously. So I think it's, I don't think it's actually, I, I think it's just about thinking it through. I don't think that there's um, any dramatic change that's needed here, but I think it's just important to think about it. And it's why I think a focus more on thinking about the trustworthiness of science is a good way to think about it. Uh, David Prosser from Research Libraries UK. My question is um, in part a follow-up to that. I mean, you spoke about the way in which uh, research papers should evolve and change to, mm. to reflect different types, null results, uh, incremental um, additions and such like. But it seems that in many countries around the world, the, the, the research paper as the version of record is, is used very much as an evaluation tool. There are, there are some countries represented by people here that your research only counts if you publish it in a journal with an impact factor above a certain value. Um, here with the REF, you, you have your four or five best papers. How can funders and, and, and the rest of us ensure that the reward structures are put in place that encourage the publication of null results, incremental changes and such like? Um, well, it's a very important question, and I think it, it, it it's goes very broadly, because the question is actually how do you incentivize people to work in large teams? How do you incentivize uh, people to collect large data sets that they then make available for others to analyze? Um, and so I think that the, the whole issue of how credit is ascribed is something that the community needs to think about collectively. But it's surely important that, um, as it were, if you generate a biobank, for example, which is a uh, population study of half a million people in the UK aged between 40 and 69, um, which will collect um, all sorts of physiological information about 
us, and I say us because I'm one of the volunteers in it, they are, I've given away my age. Um, and, um, but it, it, the serious point is how do you incentivize people not only to, as it were, write the paper, but to collect the data, to make the data available. And I think that we have, as it were, to take advantage of the API as a tool to basically identify and credit people. And so it's a cultural issue because it's also a cultural issue of people acknowledging and citing. But again, if you do your publications, uh, this happens almost automatically now, potentially. Um, and so I think it's not just, as it were, how do you... And, and of course, what is the publication of record? Well, I mean, again, you do need to have a, a, a sort of hallmarking system um, that identifies what the original is. So, I mean, you do need a, a DOI, something like that. Raise one hand in the back. Raise your hand high. Yeah. Right to the back. Hello, Alain Zazani from Imperial College. Um, talking about algorithms, I would like to ask you, um, what do you think will be the role of librarian in this algorithmic, uh, in the future algorithmic library? And perhaps talking about skills in that frame of mind, what kind of skills we need to aim for? Um, well, I mean, I suppose, I'm not sure why, as it were, being a librarian is different from other um, occupations in a sense that I don't think being a librarian is going to be a singular occupation. It seems to me that you're going to have teams of people and those teams of people will bring different skills. Um, will every library have someone who writes algorithms? I doubt it. Um, but I suspect that national libraries look different from local libraries and I think it's just an interesting question as to what the array of libraries will look like in 50 years time. But it seems to me that um, if you like the the indexing the sort of Dewey system and things like that, those were librarians. Um, it seems to me that at least some of the world of libraries, some of the people who work in libraries, will actually be people who have mathematical, who have computer science training, who will actually apply their creativity and their imagination to working out how the library can deliver knowledge to all of us in ways that haven't been dreamt of so far. Um, so I just think it reflects my view that actually being a librarian at the moment is an extraordinarily creative um, opportunity. Paul Aris has a question. Thank you. Uh, Paul Aris from UCL. Uh, so Mark, one of the things that LIBA has uh, increasingly uh, done and, and you know, had to do over the last few years is to advocate to uh, decision makers and policy makers in, in the UK yeah. Uh, in my own country and at, at uh, European level at Brussels on uh, policy changes, say, in copyright or in the open science debate, which we felt would be helpful to libraries and to researchers. Yes. So my, my question is, what's the best way of getting on a policymaker's radar screen? What, what do we need to do to attract attention so they will actually listen to what we've got to say? Um, that's a, that's a, a good question, and I suppose there's two parts to it. Um, I mean, firstly, you've got to communicate very effectively. And one of the worst ways of communicating is actually to prepare a report 200 pages long and drop it on a policymaker's desk. That, that works badly, I would say. Um, so it's actually about very, very clear and uh, pithy communication. Um, and that's, my comment is nothing to do with the fact that, as it were, policymakers can't read 200 pages. It's just they have 200 pages to read every night, but it's 100 different documents, each of two pages long. And so you have to communicate the argument clearly. Um, but the other side of the coin is that actually you need a customer on the policymaker side as well. Um, and it's much easier to land a report if you've got a, 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 a harbour to land it in. And so I think that there's an element of um, informal discussion with uh, policymakers, and particularly you know, in Brussels with officials, um, uh, to establish, as it were, a routine, and then to communicate very clearly. Um, and it's not a question of also, I would say, as it were, crude advocacy. It's a question of really articulating the arguments as to, it was the question you asked first, why does indexing matter? Because it's not necessarily immediately obvious to a, an elected policymaker why indexing matters and what it can do. So I think it does start with a very clear vision of what it is you have the potential to achieve, why um, it's a, an advantage on the present system, 
And then I think you need, there's nothing short of, you know, quite careful work to identify the key uh, uh, officials um, uh, to enter into discussion. May I have a little remark here? Yeah. So, uh, as you mentioned, that it's very important to make your uh, message clear and, and short. Actually, this morning, the Copyright Working Group had a workshop, and uh, we were practicing this. <laughs> how, how to put your message very short and very clear and understandable and uh, suitable level. But do we have some other questions from the floor? Raise your hand clearly so that it's possible to see. Actually, I, I have several questions, <laughs> but while people are thinking, I, I ask one. You mentioned Internet of Things, yes. and I, I have also been thinking, so to li we libraries, we could find our role there. Metadata is, of course, yeah. one, one question there, but uh, could you see some other roles for, for libraries, and what do you see um, uh, as the importance of the Internet of Things? Well, I think that's a, that's a really interesting question, and I think it does beg the place of what is the role of the library in the sort of the ephemera of the planet? And so libraries have actually traditionally collected ephemera, um, yeah, um, and uh, of course it's the nature of ephemera, particularly ancient ephemera, it's the stuff that you know, was found by accident. Um, in the world of the Internet of Things, the volume of data that is going to be generated is absolutely gigantic. And I think it begs another question that I can't answer, but I think is an interesting question to bait, which is what is the scope of the library? So the library of words, the library of images, the library of music, the library of numbers. Um, I, I was quite interested, actually, that why don't the libraries curate genomes. So it's quite interesting. Uh, the, Sanger, the, the Wellcome Trust has paid for many years for the curation of uh, the human genome, as have other funders. Um, should libraries curate genomes? Um, what about the catalogue of life? Should libraries curate that? I don't know the answer. It seems to me it may be the topic of a whole meeting, but it, it seems to me that there's a really interesting question as to what is the scope of what a library curates. And I think that that immediately takes into the Internet of Things because the Internet of Things is just going to be a vast um, a generation of, of, of stuff, much of which is probably rightly ephemeral and should uh, disappear in the way that much of, most ephemera does. Um, what's the relationship between the library and the museum? I mean, that's an interesting question. Of course, the British Museum and the British Library were uh, in one place for a long time, but what's the relationship with preserving objects? Uh, interesting questions. You know, the virtual object. So, Sir Mark, thank you very much for your enlightening talk. This has really been a pleasure listening to you, and, and as you saw, we, we had vivid discussions, so the audience was really interested in your, your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.